everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. This is a great turnout. We've been fretting about the turnout all night, so it's good to see this one. Um, I'm Jason. I'm from the library. I'm the library service coordinator in both Cold Spring and Richmond, so most of you probably seen me at one of those locations. Um, tonight's evening, for tonight's evening, we have a few different sponsors. Um, part of the funding from tonight came from uh, what's called Legacy Brands. Uh, that's how we do a little bit of our programming uh, in the library. Uh, the thing about Legacy Brands, we love the funding, but we can always use a little more to help us out in that regard. If there are people here that are from the area that don't have a library card, if you can come to the library and apply for one, uh, we would certainly appreciate it. They're, they take a couple minutes, they're free, and the bottom line is the more hours we have, the more items people check out, the more money we get for funding, the more programs like this we can put on. So that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, over here, we do have our event guides through May and our event sheets through May. Uh, for the next couple of weeks, we'll be having our event guides throughout the whole summer. Uh, we have a lot of great programs coming up, especially uh, family programs. And we'd love for you guys to come to any of those. Um, and before I forget, we do have uh, a Cold Spring Library and the Richmond Library Facebook page that just went up. So if any of you guys are on Facebook, you can check us out, give us a like. We greatly appreciate it. We'll be posting all our events on there. We have some pictures from today, hopefully, um, and a lot of other fun stuff as well. Uh, so we do have two other sponsors tonight. I just want to thank the Cold Spring Area Historical Society for hosting us this evening. And I also want to thank the Cold Spring Friends of the Library. They're a fantastic organization. They really uh, help us out, put on a lot of our programs. And I'll just turn it over to Brenda from the Friends, and she'll say a few things. I'll be really quick because you came here just to hear from William. But um, thank you everybody for coming tonight. I'm Brenda Tim from the Friends of the Cold Spring Library, and we're happy to be able to sponsor this this evening. A lot of our funding for tonight helps comes from our book sales. And I want you all to know you can donate books anytime to the Friends. Just bring them down to the library, and we have a place where we store them for our book sales that are in February and in July. And all whether you donate a book or donate to, to us, those monies come back into the state in this community, a lot for this programming and a lot for the children's programming. And a shout out to Laura Michael, the cookie lady who um, we got the cookies for, for tonight, so go over and have a cookie. She is at the Farmer's Market Weekly. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll turn it over to Cliff here. Um, thanks again for coming out tonight. And like I said, stop going to get a library card if you guys want to have one. Thank you. And I just want to add to the Legacy Fund, in case you've forgotten, it was you who voted to have that money set aside for programs like this, so thank you all for that vote. Um, now, the reason you're here, William Ken Kruger. written a lot about Minnesota, but he's not native. Um, Wyoming, as I recall. Maybe. Many places. <laughs> okay. um, but at some point, he decided to study anthropology, and in his studies, he studied about the Ojibwe Indians, and from there, you know, everything else happened, or happened in a good way, I guess. Um, uh, he's, he's, I think every book that I saw on the list has some award by it. I saw Anthony and uh, Barry and Minnesota Book and Edgar and uh, uh, New York Times bestseller list and so, you know, um, it, you know, what a privilege we have to welcome here tonight. Can you hear me? You bet. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, very good, very good. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Minnesota, or the Cold Spring um, Area Historical Society and the Friends of the Library for making this event possible for you this evening, um, helping me be here. Um, before I begin anything else, I want to talk to you a little bit about libraries. 
their importance to you, their importance to me, their importance to all of us. And I'm going to tell you a story that I usually tell when I begin a library event. And it goes like this. When I was 12 years old, the summer between my 6th and 7th grade year, I was a Boy Scout. And that was the summer I decided I was going to get my reading merit badge. Now, one of the requirements for the reading merit badge, at least back then, was that you had to spend some time volunteering at your local library. I was living in a little town in Ohio at that point, so I went to our librarian and made the arrangements, and when the time came, I showed up to do my duty. Now, this was long before they had computerized check-in and check-out. Do you guys remember that little pocket thing that used to be inside the eye cover when that slipped inside? So what they did was they put me to work date stamping the return of books. So they gave me this little black ink pad and a little changeable rubber date stamp. And so for the first hour I was there, it was sort of ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. And after about an hour of that, the librarian walked my way and proceeded to ask me that question and because uh, because I was afraid she was going to ask me, I pretty much knew she would. She said to me, Kent, what do you like to read? <laughs> well, you know, see how truth was, I like to read comic books. <laughs> but I didn't want to tell her that. So I briefly considered lying to her, but there was that whole, a scout is trustworthy thing going on. <clears throat> so I told her the truth. And without batting an eye, she said to me, have you ever read the Count of Monte Cristo. So I walked out of the library that day with that great Dumas classic under my under my arm, and I came back several days later and checked out the Three Musketeers. And after that, it was the Man in the Iron Mask. And when I'd read everything our little library had by Dumas, I asked her, "What should I read next?" And she turned me on to Jules Verne and H. G. Wells and Arthur Conan Doyle, and Jack London, and Robert Louis Stevenson, and all these guys who wrote these, these, these great stories that were perfect for capturing a boy's heart and a boy's imagination. I don't know how you think about your librarians. Um, I don't think of them as those people who, uh, who just keep the books on the shelves in the right order, or maybe give us a hard time when we return them a little late. I think of librarians in a very real way as our guides in understanding the world, particularly when we're young. And they help, help direct us to those books that will, will help us understand the world better. I don't think of libraries as, as just these, these four walls. I think of libraries as the archives of our culture. I mean, libraries, there are places that, that that house those books that tell us who we were, where we came from. Maybe help us understand who we are now, where we are now. Maybe we can point the, the direction for where we're going, who we, who we might become, who we could become. When our libraries are gone, and our, li and our librarians with them, there goes everything we are as a people. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do this evening is join me in a round of applause for all the good work our librarians do. You know, I feel really comfortable, really in familiar territory being here this evening because I grew up in Cold Spring. Well, actually, I grew up in a town so very like Cold Spring. I spent my adolescence in a small town in Midwest Ohio called Bluffton. It was surrounded by cornfields and hills with woods, where as a Boy Scout I would camp, as I'm sure the Boy Scouts around here do. And it was a heavily quarried area. The first swimming certificate I ever got was from um, having to show my ability to swim in the quarry that was at the edge of Bluffton and that was used as our public swimming area. They had roped off a particular area of that, of that quarry for us all to swim in. Now the story that was told to me was that if you swam out far enough and you went down deep enough, you could still see the machinery that was on the bottom of that quarry. Uh, because when, it, when they struck the spring that filled it up, filled up so quickly, all the machinery was still down there. 
I don't know if it was true, but it was a great story. <laughs> so it feels really comfortable for me to be here this evening. I just want to add this. Um, as Cliff indicated, I'm not native to Minnesota. My first real introduction to this part of the state came as a result of reading a guy named John Hassler. Yeah, yeah, you guys know him. He evoked the sensibility of this place and its people in such a beautiful way. Staggerford is still one of my favorite all-time novels. So I do feel comfortable and, uh, and, and so warmly welcome, and thank you for having me here today. Before I begin my prepared remarks, I just have a quick question I want to ask. Is there anybody here who's never read a William Kent Kruger novel? Oh, okay. Okay, okay, get out. Now I find it I find it I always ask that question of an audience because I never want to assume everybody here knows uh, who I am and what the hell it is that I do. So my first minute of remarks are for those of you who raised a hand. I do publish under that very Literary three name thing, William Kent Kruger. I go by Kent. So if we have a chance to talk today, feel free to call me Kent. I live in St. Paul. I have now for uh, 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 about 37 years with my uh, with my wife of uh, 45 years. <laughs> yeah. This one. Um, our children are in St. Paul, our grandson is in St. Paul. I love, love, love living in St. Paul. Probably best known as the author of the Cork O'Connor mystery. Wait a minute. I'm probably best known as the, I love saying this, author of the New York Times bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> Series, which is set up in the great north woods of Minnesota. My protagonist, Corporal O'Connor, is the former sheriff of the fictional Tamarack County. He's a man of mixed heritage. He's part Irish American and he's part Ojibwe, Anishinaabe. Because of that mixture in his heritage, and largely because of the area in which I, I've chosen to set my work, a lot of the stories that I write come from issues that rise out of the interface of those two cultures, white and Ojibwe. So I've heard about Indian gaming casinos and the effect that that's had both on the Ojibwe community and the surrounding white community. Uh, I've written about you know, the ongoing battle we have in Minnesota over hunting and fishing treaty rights. Uh, I've written about the influx of the drug and the gang cultures uh, on the reservation. Always at, at some level, I try to deal with the whole question of racial prejudice. First book in that series was a book called Iron Lake. I published that in 1998. Iron Lake was followed by Boundary Waters, Purgatory, Ridge, Blood, Hollow, Mercy Falls, Copper, River, Thunder Bay, Red Knife, Heaven's Keep, Vermilion, Rift, North West Angle, Hester's Point, Tamarack County, Wendigo Island, Manitou Canyon, and last fall, number 16 in the series, Sulphur Springs. Number 17, Desolation Mountain, is completed. It'll be out this August. Um, now, along the summer, I had the opportunity to write two books not a part of my series. A very long time ago, I wrote a book called The Devil's Bed, which in our business we refer to as a standalone thriller. And in 2013, I wrote the best thing I probably will ever write, a novel called Ordinary Grace. So that's what I, that's what I do. You know, I, do, um, I was talking with uh, Rita earlier, and she asked me, so, uh, so how many library events do you do, where do you do them? I do between 70 and 100 book events every year. Many, many, many of them, uh, library events. Um, so I talk about myself a lot. <laughs> And frankly, I don't interest me much in it. <clears throat> so rather than talk about me this evening, I want to talk about something that does interest me, something I'm passionate about. I want to talk about stories. They're important to me. They're important to you. They're important to all of us. And I'm going to begin by asking what on the surface is going to seem like a very simple question. Here it is. How many of you think you know how the Bible begins? Simple question, right? How many of you think you know how the Bible begins? Not many of you, huh? <laughs> okay, I'm guessing that those of you who are brave enough to raise a hand probably think the Bible begins this way. Depending upon the translation, you probably believe the Bible begins this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
Well, I have a different take on this. I think the Bible begins before you read that first sentence. I think the Bible begins even before you crack the cover on that great spiritual text. I think the Bible begins with this seductive whisper that comes to you from that great book itself. And what it whispers to you is this. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. Because is it, isn't that what the Bible is? A collection of some of the greatest stories ever told. It's, uh, it's the story of the creation. It's the story of, of Noah and the great flood. It's the story of Moses in the Exodus. Of, uh, of Daniel in the lion's den. Of, uh, of uh, um, David in the, in, the, in the hot water he gets himself into with God because of Bathsheba. In the New Testament, it's that beautiful Christmas story. The story of the birth of Jesus. And it's the, the tragic story of his betrayal and crucifixion. And it's the glorious story of the resurrection. Story after story after story. Just think about it for a moment. Three of the great religions of the world, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, all draw inspiration from many of these same stories. I had a guy write to me not too long ago uh, to tell me how much he enjoyed Ordinary Grace. Uh, I love getting uh, emails like that, so don't hold back. If you're doing my work and you want to let me know. Uh, among, the, among the things he had to say about Ordinary Grace, he had, also had a few things he wanted to, to say about sermons, because uh, Ordinary Grace is the story of a minister, and so there are sermons involved. And basically what he said to me was this. Uh, Dear Kent, when I... Uh, when I go to church, I go to a Unitarian church. We have a wonderful minister there. She gives terrific sermons. She's, she's intelligent. But the truth is, when I get home and think about what she said, all I remember are the stories she told. You know, I don't know, I don't know about you guys, but that certainly rings true for me. Now, I'm going to go out on the limb here. And I'm going to suggest that most of us here this evening didn't come to our understanding of right and wrong as a result of anything we heard from the pulpit or any intellectual discussion we might have had about uh, Thomas Aquinas or Kierkegaard. I think most of us got our first glimmer of what it was to do the right thing as a result of stories that we heard or were read to as children and that, that had a profound impact on us. That's certainly true for me. My first understanding of what it was to do the right thing came as a result of a book that was read to me when I was five years old and was written by a guy who called himself Dr. Seuss. <laughs> the book, Horton Hatches the Egg. <laughs> now, for those of you who might not remember that great moral treatise, um, it goes like this. It opens with, with uh, a lazy bird named Maisie who's sitting on an egg in a nest uh, waiting for the egg to hatch. And Maisie is bored out of her mind. She would rather be anywhere else than sitting on that egg waiting for it to hatch. And along comes Horton, who is really a good-hearted elephant. And Maisie convinces Horton to give her a break. Take a little time on the egg for her while she gets some rest. So Horton sells this huge bulk atop that fragile little egg. And just before Maisie takes off, he promises her absolutely he will be there when she returns. But Maisie has no intention of ever coming back. So there sits Horton, night and day through all kinds of horrible weather. The other animals in the jungle make fun of him. One day, some hunters show up, and they're so amazed to see this huge elephant atop this fragile little egg that instead of shooting him, they capture him. And they take him and the tree and the nest and the egg, and they, and they cart them over, over the seas, and they sell Horton to a circus as a sideshow exhibit. And all through this horrible experience, Horton has held to a beautiful little mantra that he repeats to himself. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant, in elephant's faithful 100%. <laughs> so one day, Maisie, is, uh, Maisie Bird is, uh, is out there flying around. She sees Horton. So she circles down to Horton and just just at the moment she reaches him, the egg hatches. And out comes not a Maisie bird, 
but a beautiful little elephant bird that looks exactly like Horton. And at the end of the story, Horton and his little hatchling head off for home, and Horton is happy 100%. Faithfulness. The importance of keeping the promises that we make. I learned that at five from an elephant named Horton. And of course, after Horton hatches the egg, I had to read Horton Here's a Who, from which I learned, a person's a person, no matter how small. Which has always struck me as a philosophy that if we really, really lived, it would make the world such a better place. I learned a lot from Horton about what it is to be a good elephant and also what it is to be a good human being. Uh, you guys have seen those uh, those bumper stickers that people have on their cars, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I have a bumper sticker on my car, WWHD, what would Horton do? <laughs> we think of stories as entertainment, but clearly stories do so much more. Stories enlighten us as well, but they do more than that. Stories encourage us. Um, I don't know if you know the story of Robert the Bruce and the persistent little spider. It's a tale my father told me when I was quite young and I've always remembered it. For those of you who don't know the story, it goes like this. Uh, Robert the Bruce ascended to the throne of Scotland in, I believe it was 1306. And this was in the time when Scotland was still under the tyrannical uh, uh, rule of uh, English, thumb of English rule. And they've been trying forever to free themselves from England uh, uh, to no great success. You guys remember the movie Braveheart? It's a story of William Wallace who tried to free Scotland. And if you saw the movie, the Mel Gibson movie, you, you know how that turned out for William Wallace. Um, so after Wallace fails and Robert the Bruce ascends to the Scottish throne, he takes up that battle for independence. And twice he leads his army against the English. And twice He's defeated. And after that second defeat, he takes off uh, on the run with the, the English right on his tail. And Robert the Bruce, so the story goes, one night seeking refuge, takes shelter in an abandoned stone cottage in the, in the Scottish uh, Highlands. And while he's there resting and licking his wounds and trying to figure out what the hell he's going to do next, he happens to look up into the rafters above his head. And he watches a spider attempting to spin a web. And what the spider's trying to do is cast up one thread from one rafter to another to form the foundation for the web it wants to spin. And six times it casts its thread. And six times it fails. But on the seventh it succeeds and begins to spin a beautiful little web. And Robert the Bruce, so the story goes, taking encouragement from the persistence of that little spider, decides he's going to lead his army against the English one more time. And he does. And this time he wins. He frees Scotland. It's a great story. Is it true? Who the hell cares? <laughs> it's a great story with an important point at the heart. So stories don't just entertain us, they enlighten us, and they encourage us. But maybe the most important of all, stories inspire us. I'm going to tell you a story about inspiration that came from a great piece of writing. Inspiration, in the end, gone terribly awry. So, when I was in the fifth grade, Toward the end of that year, our teacher read to, to the whole class The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. She did it for half an hour every day after lunch. I loved that book. He was a kid who was just like me. He was out there on the Mississippi River having all of these great adventures. Now, I was living then um, in a little farmhouse outside Bluffton, Ohio. And, uh, and this, uh, this creek ran through our property, Riley Creek. And on the other side of Riley Creek was another farmhouse where the Gratz family lived. And the Gratzes had two boys. Uh, the youngest was my age and the older was my brother's age. Now, at the end of that year, I pitched the idea to my brother and the Gratz boys 
that we should build a raft and set sail on Riley Creek. So, two miles down Riley Creek was Bluffton, the town where we all went to school. And a couple of miles beyond that, it emptied into a large river that if we followed it, would take us all the way to Lake Erie. It was a grand scheme. And they bought it. <laughs> so we spent a few days uh, gathering scavenged wood and pounding it together with nails, and in some cases we, we had to lash it together. And when our creation was, was all complete, we hauled it down to Riley Creek and set it in the water beneath a bridge that spanned the creek, and we hung a, a rope down from, uh, from the bridge so that we could get down to the, to the uh, raft. And then we drew straws to see who was going to test our little creation. My brother drew the, the long straw. So he took off his high top keds, because our mother would have killed us if we'd come home with wet, wet, muddy sneakers. He rolled up his pant legs and he started down the rope. He got to the raft and holding tightly to that rope, he put out one bare foot to test the stability of the raft. The raft held. And he put out his other foot and the raft held. So he decided it was time to give it the full, the full thing. He let go of the rope, put his full weight on that raft, and the raft immediately disappeared beneath the brown water of Royal Creek. Before I went under it, tipped, and it threw my brother, and he disappeared beneath the brown water of Riley Creek, which wasn't, you know, a terrible thing, because Riley Creek was like three feet deep at that point. And he came up all wet and covered with mud from the creek bottom, and that was pretty much the end of our grand expedition. <laughs> but I've taken, I've taken two, two important things away from that experience. And the first was this. It's the understanding that no matter how much I wanted Riley Creek to be it, it would never be the Mississippi River. <laughs> and the other was this. An image I've carried across a lifetime of the biggest, blackest leech I have ever seen that had attached itself to my brother's bare foot. It's the only time I ever heard my brother scream like a baby. <laughs> and I never let him forget it. <laughs> you know, Ever since we first <coughs> learned how to communicate with one another as, as, as human beings, stories have been an important part of who we are. Across countless millennia, stories haven't just entertained us. They have enlightened us and encouraged us and inspired us. I have to tell you this. I have come to believe that stories are every bit as important to us as breathing. And as a storyteller, I have to say this. I think the most seductive, the most promising, maybe the most important words we're ever going to hear are these. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. Thanks very much. I always like to leave a lot of time uh, uh, at, at the end of a presentation for questions. It's maybe my favorite time of the time. So this is the time if you have questions that you would like to ask me to toss them out. Yeah. So can you kind of think the whole so the question really is, how has essentially the digital age, the electronic age, uh, which is transforming a lot of how we read, how has that affected me? It really hasn't affected me in the least. As an author, I just want to make sure that my work gets in the hands of readers. And how that occurs it, it, it is, is, uh, is not a concern of mine. Whether you read the real book, whether you read it on an e-reader of some kind, whether you listen to it as an audio book, I don't care. I just want you to, uh, to be familiar with it and read my work. Now that said, there are healthy ways to read and there are unhealthy ways to read. Okay, not too long ago I read a meta-analysis that 
and came to the conclusion that reading a real book was healthier than reading an electronic book. They found this. Reading a real book, you remember the story better. And the thinking on this is, is that as you read a real book, your brain is chronicling where in the story that event occurred. You're the beginning, in the middle, toward the end. When you're in an e-reader, you're at sea. You have no idea where you are in that story. Um, they found that people who read a real book, as opposed to those who read an e-book, sleep better at night. <laughs> and here's an interesting finding, and I don't know where they got this one, but people who read real books are more sympathetic in the response to people who are experiencing adversity than people who read e-books. <laughs> So always my response when people ask me about that is, you know, given a choice, why not do the healthy thing, you know? But again, and I have to tell you that probably 40% of my income, the royalties from book sales now, come from the electronic editions of my book. There are lots of good reasons for, for e-readers. Um, you can en enlarge the print. So if you have difficulty seeing, you just enlarge the print on the screen. Many, many people don't live anywhere near a bookstore, but they can download uh, a book on their Kindle from uh, any number of places, and it's there right away. Uh, you carry a, 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 an e-reader uh, uh, on a trip with you, and you've got like 30 books right there, as opposed to a whole stack. So I, there, are, there are certainly valid reasons for using an e-reader. So, in terms of me, I don't care. <laughs> Just read me. <laughs> Yes. How much of uh, ordinary days can you influence by preventing your own life? I think about. Sure. That's a that's a wonderful question. So the question is, how how were they essentially how much of the story of ordinary grace was influenced? by events in my own life. Now, for those of you who haven't read Ordinary Grace, it's a very different kind of story than I typically tell in my Corporal Connor series. It takes place in the summer of 1961. Um, it's set in a small town deep in the very beautiful Minnesota River Valley. It's the story of a Methodist minister whose beloved child is murdered. That's the compelling mystery component. But at heart, it's really the story of what that terrible tragedy does to this man's faith, his family, and ultimately the entire fabric of this small town in which he lives. It is the nearest I've ever come to autobiographical writing. There is a lot of who I am and what I experience in Ordinary Grace. So, uh, so the town of New Bremen, although it's sort of loosely, I use New Hall as a foundation. Really, I put so many things from the small towns I grew up in into, into New Bremen. So for those of you who have read Ordinary Grace, the quarry, where the kids swim, I swam in that quarry. Um, the, uh, the pharmacy, where the kids sit root beer. I sipped Richardson's root beer in that pharmacy. I got my hair cut for those boys get their hair cut. Um, I played on those, those trestles over the river. Um, many other people out of my own life. A drum family. It's my family. It's, it is based on my family. Uh, my father was not a Methodist minister in small towns, but he was a high school English teacher in small towns. And anybody who grows up, anybody who knows small towns, you know that teachers, uh, ministers, bankers, these are people who, because of, of the position they hold in the community, are a little more closely scrutinized by a community. So I knew that whole fishbowl, uh, fishbowl thing. Now, Ruth Drum, the minister's wife, is a woman not happy being a minister's wife. When she married Nathan Drum, the minister, he was heading off to World War II, and his plan was to come back and become a hotshot lawyer. That was the guy she married. But the war so changes Nathan Drum that when he comes back, he becomes a minister instead. And that's not what she signed on for. Ruth Drum is a woman who imagined her life to be about music, about the arts. But she has to try to, to do what a minister's wife is supposed to do, and to, to be the homemaker, because that's really the role women, when I was growing up, were expected to play in the family. And, she, and Ruth is not very good at any of that. That was my mother. 
<laughs> my mother graduated from uh, Drake University in Des Moines with a double degree. She had a degree in music. She had an ethereal soprano voice, a uh, pretty good way with the keyboard, and, uh, and a degree in drama. Oh my God, was she a drama? <laughs> but she, I know, wanted her life to be played out in front of an audience, but she had to be the homemaker. What a stifling thing for her. And I loved my mother dearly, but she was terrible at being a homemaker. She was an alleged terrible bad girl. Uh, the Drum Kids, that's kind of a reflection of, uh, of my brothers and my sister and I, the, the relationship we had growing up. Um, Gus, I worked with Gus, if you know the story, Ordinary Grace, Gus is an important character. I worked with Gus in the orchards of, of uh, Oregon when I was in high school. Um, Doyle, the odd cop. I worked with Doyle in the cannery in Oregon when I was earning money for college. Um, so I put a lot of, a lot of myself, my experience into that story, yes. Thank you for asking. My heart is in that story. Yep. Do you think you can write a story that doesn't have you in? Ah, are you a writer? <coughs> yes. Yeah. That's a writer's question. That's a writer's question. That's scary that you could ask that question. It <laughs> did. What do you think? <laughs> All of my books are history-based, so I haven't had to face the issue yet. Do you know but how you perceive history and how you report history is an large man, comes a large man out of who you are, don't you think? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, I was right. <laughs> um, I think what goes into any story you tell is your understanding of the world. And that's who you are, that's your understanding. So yeah, I don't think you can write a story without you being there. And how you tell the story, how you perceive the events of the story, what they mean in the long run, all of that. There's a who you are, I think. I think. Yeah? Do you write with an outline, or do you write like everyone? Yeah, so the question is how I, how I go about creating my work. Do I work from an outline? or, as many writers do, do I fly by the seat of my pants? Um, it depends on the kind of writing I'm doing. When I'm writing a book in my Cork O'Connor series, when I'm writing a mystery, I typically will use an outline. Here's, here's generally how it goes with a Cork O'Connor novel. When you're with a large New York publishing house, I'm with Simon & Schuster, uh, your, the book contract that you sign is typically going to be a multiple book contract. There are going to be two, three, sometimes even four books covered in that contract. So whenever I'm at work on a Corpo Potter novel, I know I have another contractual obligation after this one. So at some point, while I'm working on my current project, I try to open myself to my thinking about, what, if I haven't already, what's this next Corpo Potter novel going to be about? And I've always been really fortunate to have at least the seed of a good, compelling idea settle itself in my head. And, uh, and when I'm finishing my project across, uh, across several weeks or even several months, that seed of an idea is rolling around in my head. And, uh, and characters are suggesting themselves to me, and events, and, and motivation, and chronology. And at the end of that long thinking period, I know the story. I know how it begins, I know how it ends, I know who did what to whom and why. Um, and in the old days, I used to actually sit down and I would outline that story chapter by chapter. So I knew what every chapter was supposed to accomplish in moving that story forward. I don't do that anymore because I've been at this so long, I can keep the story in my head. And I do that because mysteries are the most tightly woven fabric of storytelling that there is. Everything depends so significantly on everything else. And, and what is a mystery? It's literary sleight of hand. It, it, if you're playing fair with readers in a mystery, you're giving them everything, you're presenting them with everything they need to have to solve the mystery. But at the same point in time, as you're pointing this, as you're offering this to them, this clue, you're trying to point their eyes somewhere else. You know? Like a good magician. Um, so, so if you're going to try to fool them in terms of where you're going, 
How can you fool them if you don't know where you're going? <laughs> so that's why I have always thought my stories through in the core book honor series. A lot of writers work entirely differently. Ordinary Grace was very different than the, the follow-up novel, companion novel to Ordinary Grace that I'm working on right now. Also very different in that um, I, had, I allowed Ordinary Grace to reveal itself to me as I wrote it. When I went into Ordinary Grace, I knew three, three or four things. I knew, um, I knew I was going to be writing about my family. I knew that. I knew I was going to be writing about a small town that was very like the small towns I grew up in in my adolescence. Um, I knew that uh, I knew that I wanted to talk about the spiritual journey that would be important, and I knew that somebody was going to be murdered because that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but but given that I I let the story reveal itself to me as I wrote it, it was an extraordinary, just an extraordinary experience, um, and I have tried to allow that same process to work in the companion novel that I'm writing now for Ordinary Grace, and I'm just having a ball with it. Will do, will do. <laughs> yeah, up here. What part of you is him? <laughs> and what, what part of you persists in keeping him alive, even though he has been many times ready to go himself? Yeah. Yeah, because when Henry goes, there goes a huge part of the energy of, of every book of ours. So I've been really reluctant to let him go. <laughs> so Henry, about three books ago, for those of you who haven't read my corporate book series, Henry Malou is an important character in the series, a recurring character. He's a mute. He is, uh, he is an Ojibwe healer. Um, and he's the nearest thing I write to a stock character, a wise old medicine man. Um, Henry is um, Henry is wise. He's he's funny. He's compassionate. He's brave, and he farts a lot. <laughs> so I've done my best to make Henry a real human being, while while at the same time having him be a vehicle for expressing all kinds of um, what I, I think are beautiful ideas about about life and spirit and, and how we all relate to one another. So, Henry is uh, more than 100 years old. <laughs> Not absolutely forever. And, uh, and Henry won't either. And you're going to have a glimpse of that at the end of the next Corp O'Connor novel. It doesn't matter. Oh, you bring that question up. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. And I don't... How much of Henry is me? God only knows. God only knows. I love writing Henry because whenever I write a scene in which Henry Malou plays a part, I almost never have to rewrite that scene. Henry says exactly what Henry was supposed to say. Where does that come from? I have no idea. Henry was this blessing that was delivered to me. And, and, uh, and, and the only thing I can do is just say thank you. You know? Yeah. Uh, there's a question over here. You talk a lot about stories and uh, learning from stories and excuse my ignorance, your problem done this already. What do you do have specifically written books for children six to ten? Uh, not books. I, I have written stories. Uh, short stories. Do you know the publication Boys Life? <laughs> Boys Life is the official scout publication. It has a subscription of four million kids across the world. So I have written short stories for Boys Life, which is aimed at kids about ten books, primarily boys, although now uh, young women are scouts, um, ten, in the 10 to 12, 13 age group. Um, but I have never felt compelled to write a, a, a whole book for that age. Yet, I have a story in my head that I would like to do, but I haven't had the time yet. But I would like to do it. Because that's an important group. God bless J.K. Rowling. Uh, God bless uh, Rick Riordan, who writes the Percy Jackson series. God bless all of these people who write stories like H.G. Wells did, and, and Robert Louis Stevenson did, and, and Jack London did, that capture kids' hearts and help them understand the power and, and enjoyment that a great story. Yeah. 
it seems to me that uh, that Henry has got to have uh, some long lost son or a younger brother someplace. He has a son. But I mean, that, that, that maybe that younger brother that's all of a sudden going to appear someday. <laughs> <laughs> Henry's long lost son uh, was at the heart of uh, Thunder Bay, and I I don't know that there are any um, other uh, unknown relatives who will. Um, soap opera like pop out of the wood. Well, you may be inspired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else? Anything else? Yeah. How did you choose Aurora, Minnesota as the setting for Coracopunter? So the question is, how did I choose Aurora as the setting for my Coracopunter series? Do you know the real Aurora? I'm so delicious. I didn't know it was a real city. Okay, there is, there is a real Aurora, Minnesota up in the Arrowhead. <laughs> That is not my aurora. <laughs> Here's the story of my aurora. Um, when, I was, uh, when I had written my first novel in the series, Iron Lake, and my publisher bought that story, the town was not called Aurora, it was called Wendigo. Um, and for a variety of reasons, my publisher asked me to change the name. And so I wanted to come up with a name that for me was evocative of the North Country. And Aurora did. But there was already a real Aurora, not far from the Aurora I was thinking of. So I, I, I called my editor and I said, I want to call my town Aurora, but here's the problem. There's a real Aurora, can I go ahead and do this? And his response was, well, if you don't do anything that's going to get us sued, sure. <laughs> So I made my kind of Aurora, and my Aurora is an amalgam of many elements of the Northwoods towns that I know and love. I wanted to create a town that anybody who knows the North Country, knows the Arrowhead, um, would, would understand it's real, but they couldn't say it's evil, or it's bad, or it's you know, anything else. So, so that's the story of my Aurora. Now, after Iron Lake came out, I got an email that went like this. Dear Mr. Kruger, greetings from the real Aurora, Minnesota. It was from a librarian in there. They said, we have your book. We think you've done a great job. Now, I had a chance not long after that to go up and visit the library in Aurora, Minnesota. And the head librarian took me into the stacks and she pulled Iron Lake off the shelf. And she said, you know, when any of our patrons come in and they don't really know what they want to read, I always tell them you should read this. She said, invariably, they come back and say, we want to live in this Aurora. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. What authors inspire me when I'm writing? Depends on what I'm writing. If I'm writing a Cork O'Connor story, I am greatly inspired by the work of a guy named Tony Hillerman. Uh, for those of you who aren't nodding at that name, Tony Hillerman was an icon in our genre. He wrote a series set in the Four Corners area of the Southwest that dealt significantly with the Diné culture, the culture of the Navajo. And he was really the first guy to use a non-majority uh, group of people as, as the main players in his work. Um, and he opened the door for, for me and for so many of us now to write about the other cultures in, in the United States. Um, so Tony Hillman continues to inspire me. Um, uh, in the genre, uh, there are guys, uh, James, a guy named James Lee Burke, who writes a series that's set in New Orleans and is probably the most beautiful worker in prose that we have in the mystery genre. If I could just write a sentence as beautiful as all rats, my, my day would be made. But when I'm, when I'm thinking outside, particularly when I'm thinking about something like Ordinary Grace or something like uh, This Tender Land, I really want I really get a lot of inspiration from, um, from classic American writers. So, because uh, the land is so important in my stories, I think about Steinbeck and how beautiful it be evoked, the Salinas Valley, or, or, or the Dust Bowl, uh, uh, Oklahoma, the Dust Bowl. Um, I try to write as succinctly and as powerfully in how I structure my work as Hemingway did. I fall far short. 
because I like to be a little more poetic than heavyweight ones. Um, I would love to be able to say I wrote a book as fine as the great cats. So those are some of the people who who inspired me to try to do better. Cormac McCarthy. I can never understand the Cormac McCarthy story, but I love how he tells it. <laughs> Uh, let's see, maybe time for one more burning question. If there's one, yeah? I'm just curious what your personal experience, experiences are on all the waters from the shore of that area. Because there's so many books that are out there that seem to capture it so well. Yeah, well, thank you very much. For those of you who didn't uh, hear the comment, she was uh, she was complimenting me mm -hmm. on how well I capture the, the environment and the spirit. Uh, of the Arrowhead and the North Shore. So I told you I'm not native to Minnesota. Uh, we didn't move here until we were about 30 years old, so Diane could go to the U of M Law School. And before that, I was in like this gypsy kid and the doll over the place. Uh, never really had anywhere that I called or thought of his home, but I swear to God, the minute we set foot in Minnesota, I knew I found home. I fell in love with this place. And shortly after we moved here, we began doing what everybody in the Twin Cities does. We started vacationing up north in the beautiful north end. We started spending a portion of every summer at a YMCA camp that uh, is north of Ely, a place called Camp du Nord. And it's literally across the road from the Boundary Waters Canary Road. And when I discovered that remarkable place, I knew that's what I wanted to write about. So, um, so I have over the years spent as much time as I can up north, just soaking, soaking up the north country. And and my other favorite place up there is along the north shore, that stunning shoreline of Kitchigami. Um, and all I try, and one of the reasons I think I'm a writer, and so many, so many other writers are writers, is that for whatever reason we have this capacity to go to a place and soak it up like a sponge, and then when we write, it's like we squeeze that sponge out and it comes out on the page, and we find the right words to make it to people who know the place. Uh, you know, when somebody from uh, from New Jersey writes and says, "Oh, I love how you write about the North Country. I'd love to go there someday." That's just fine. But when somebody from the range says, you know, that means a lot. <laughs> Folks, before I let you go this evening, I want to say one more thing. Um, I think I was talking to Cliff earlier about sort of this, a, a turnout like this. And he was asking me, so, so do you often get turnouts like this? Well, here's the truth. When I began my career as a writer, I had the same experience every writer has at the beginning of their career, wherein you set up an event, a book signing, that might be hours away from your house. And you travel all the way out to that, that bookstore to do the signing, and the only ones there are you, and the bookseller, and the bookseller's cat. <laughs> And I began a little ritual that I have followed to this day. I was, I was with Diane when I followed my little ritual today. In advance, just in advance of an event, I say a prayer. And my prayer goes like this. Please, dear Lord, let there be people. <laughs> thank you, Lord, and thank you all for